Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Juneteenth and the Future of Democracy. I'd like to welcome Glenn to the stage to begin our session. Thanks so much, Callie. Um, it's my singular honor today to moderate this crucial speech by Danielle Allen, who's one of the most powerful and important both intellectual and political voices in our world today. Danielle has a life that defies description and I really suggest that you read up on it, uh, both online and by reading her uh, really powerful uh, memoir of the death of her cousin, um, Cuz. But I'll, I'll keep my words more personal uh, to me and, and short today. What most impresses me about Danielle is her really unique capacity for integrative knowledge and communication. Her capacity to firmly ground the urgent need for fundamental reimagining of our democracy in an understanding not just of America's revolutionary democratic roots, but um, classical democracy as bases of our present imaginations. In doing so, she truly captures the meaning of the word revolution, which is at once an overturning and a return to foundations. At the same time, her intellectual capacity for integrative knowledge generation and her consistent attitude of public and democratic engagement is mirrored in the content of her philosophy, which is the most eloquent contemporary expression I've encountered of the ideas of cooperative plurality. Yet Danielle has not just been my most important contemporary philosophical influence. She's also been an extraordinary on the ground leader of cross sectoral collaborations that made the best effort we saw in the US to save us from the ravages of COVID and the resulting crises across the West. Efforts that sadly, as I'll talk about, you know, fell short of the greatest aspirations, but were nonetheless um, incredibly uh, important. There's no more fitting voice in the world to rededicate us all today in the radical exchange movement in the United States and the broader world to the never ending and constantly experimental pursuit of self-government than Danielle Allen. So thank you, Danielle, for joining us to help us appreciate the moment of this day. Thank you so much, Glenn. That was incredibly generous, over generous, but nonetheless, I appreciate it. And it's such a pleasure to be here. You are such a special collaborator to me. I want to echo back to you some of those words you just shared with me. I find your creative, visionary imagination among the most inspiring sources of intellectual growth for myself. And so I'm just really delighted to be in collaboration with you. I've been delighted to be in collaboration intellectually. I'm delighted to be in collaboration in practical terms. And it's such a pleasure to be here with the Radical Exchange community today to talk about the work that we're trying to do about democracy. It's Juneteenth, so happy Juneteenth. That may be a new holiday for lots of you. It's not a new holiday for some of us. Um, it is, of course, the day that news of the Emancipation Proclamation reached enslaved people in Texas, and they knew that they had been free for months, uh, but now they knew and could take that knowledge forward. So I'm going to talk today about Juneteenth and the future of democracy. I am going to share some slides, though this will be um, a, not a formal presentation. I'd like to think with you about the future of democracy and what we can learn from it or about it from the history of Juneteenth. And I am going to start uh, with history. This country, the US has had a debate this year about our history provoked by a powerful package in the New York Times called the 1619 Project. The lead author was the journalist, Nicole Hannah-Jones. And in this project, what Hannah-Jones did was really resituate the concept of the American founding away from 1776. She argued that the founding really dated to the point at which the first enslaved people were brought to this country and patterns of racial domination were woven into the fabric. Now, I'm a person who has spent a lot of time thinking about 1776 and that other founding moment. And the country's debate about this history has really fractured into a, you know, yes, it was, no, it wasn't, yes, it was, no, it wasn't kind of debate as if one date or the other would be quote unquote, the founding. In fact, what this historical argument should help us see is that foundings occur along multiple dimensions. Without any question, 1619 gave us the social founding of this country. 
the social founding of a country that did put racial domination at the heart of ordinary relations among people and the structure of institutions. 1776 is also a founding. It deserves recognition as a moment of founding. It was the moment of the political founding where the political institutions were structured, the experimental mechanisms pulled into place for the first time. Foundings don't stop there. We've been founding ever since. And so that brings me to the, the Juneteenth founding, 1865, the end of the Civil War, after the first Juneteenth, in fact, in the beginning of the Civil Rights Amendments. This was a point of time for the reconstitution of the political constitution. Nobody was ready to grapple with the social constitution in 1865. So in 1865, we revised our institutions. We made freed African-Americans citizens. Um, but we did not in any fulsome way approach the question of social equality. Of course, there was a period of reconstruction and rapid movement of African-Americans into the economy and into political institutions, but it all came to a screeching halt in 1876 with the Hayes-Tilden Agreement, the agreement that brokered the presidential election, um, ensuring that the troops, the Northern troops, the Union troops rather would be pulled from the South and that there would no longer be an effort to enforce reconstruction. That gave us the Jim Crow period the Jim Crow period was characterized by the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, incredible violence and lynching against African-Americans, um, a true period of terrorism in this country. The social constitution become, became a constitution of terror. And that was then faced with another founding in 1954, the Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Board of Education. And it's only at that point, finally, in the middle of the 20th century, with the civil rights movement, that we began to come face to face with the question of our social constitution. In 1954, we took another turn at reforming our political institutions with the Voting Rights Act. We also began to think about the constitution of civil society and the important acts in the 1960s included a lot of reorganization of the ecology of associations. So rules about membership in clubs and things like that. But even then, although we again tackled our political institutions and we tackled civil society organizations, we still did not actually tackle our core social constitution marked as it had been for so long by racial domination. So here we are in 2020, and it is a chance for a refounding. We are at last at the point where we are ready to tackle our social constitution. This is a gift given to us by young people, by young people. The generational currents are so apparent in the work going on across the US. Young people have recognized the fact that you cannot have an egalitarian political constitution. You cannot have an egalitarian civil society constitution, whether those are business organizations in civil society or nonprofit organizations. You cannot have egalitarianism in the political or civil society domain if you have no equality, no justice in the social domain. Earlier generations, including my own generation, accepted a certain amount of accommodation we knew we were working on the political constitution. We knew we were working on the civil society constitution. We accepted a certain amount of accommodation with the inequities and injustices of the social constitution. And so it is a moment, a true moment of liberation that this rising generation of demonstrators and people carrying out direct actions are saying no more, no more. There is no more accommodation to be made with regard to a social constitution based on racial domination. So here we are in 2020 and we have an opportunity to understand what our obligation is to refound our own society and answer for the first time the question of how to achieve free and equal self-governance based on the interlocking positive interactions across our political institutions, our civil society and our political culture. In other words, we have the opportunity at last to build something that would count as civic strength a resource of solidarity founded on a, a platform, a foundation of social equality, including racial equality. With that foundation then also shoring up effective and responsive political institutions and a civil society that organizes our ecology of associations in ways that empower, that secure economic foundations and prosperity for all, and that invite all into power sharing for decision-making. Now, I'm gonna just dwell for a little bit of time on the political constitution. What is the job there? Because insofar as these domains of the political, the social and our civil society organizations, which include economic organizations, insofar as they all interlock with each other, 
When our vision for one piece changes, our vision for all should change. So if we are now ready to embrace a refounding of our social constitution, that actually also means we have to redescribe our objectives for our political constitution. To lay this point out, what I'd like to do is take you on a bit of journey, a journey through the history of political philosophy. So I'm gonna go back to the very beginning to the very original distinction between good and bad regimes or between well-ordered regimes and outlaw regimes. And in modern vocabulary, we would put in the category of well-ordered regimes, both democracies and decent authoritarian regimes that deliver basic material security to their people. And in the category of outlaw regimes, we would put non-decent rights violating regimes that fail to deliver even basic material security. So I'm thinking Syria and Venezuela uh, in the first category, I'm thinking both China and uh, countries across the world, Europe and so forth um, in the top category. Now that reflects an original ancient distinction between two types of rule. The question of whether rule is on behalf of the rulers or on behalf of the rule, the people who are ruled. So the outlaw regimes are the ones in which people are monopolizing co-opting power and using it only for their own sakes. So well-ordered regimes are those in which even where power has been mastered, it is being deployed for the sake of everybody, for the sake of all. Of course, the early modern period gave us a different picture of the benefits of rule. So not just this basic distinction between who benefits um, and this question of whether material security is delivered, but also a picture about rights. And that early modern uh, picture gave us then a few different categories of, of regime around the world that we could think about. So the argument of the early modern period and of the enlightenment period was that basic material security is not enough for any human being. Full thriving requires that we be able, to be able to chart our own course through life, that we be able to exercise our autonomy and develop our own potential, whatever we might determine it to be. That flourishing dependent on our own self-direction has both a requirement for negative liberties and for positive liberties. Negative liberties are those protections of free expression, freedom of association, freedom of religion, all those ways in which we want to say to the government, hands off, that's mine to decide. Positive liberties are all those ways we get to participate in control rights with regard to our society. So of course, we're constrained by social norms, we're constrained by laws. We wanna be co-authors of those. We wanna be co-authors of the shape of our communities in order that we fully exercise our capacity for autonomy across all of its dimensions. So. If we go back to a comparison between our well-ordered authoritarian regimes, again, say a China, that will be a regime that supplies basic material security. It may also even supply social rights, for example, healthcare, but it's not supplying negative liberties or rights or positive liberties or rights. Um, in contrast, you might find yourself with a rights protecting autocratic regime where there is a single point of rule, yet there is protection for negative liberties. And to some extent over time, Constitutional monarchies have periodically been in that kind of category. Of course, constitutional democracies aspire to protect rights across the three categories of negative liberties, positive liberties, and the social rights of health and education and the like. But this is the picture that we've been working with since the early modern period about what justice requires and about what good governance requires. And the suggestion I'd like to make now is that it's not enough, but it's actually time to expand our conception of what a well-ordered regime requires oops, wrong direction, uh, by adding um, another column. As I said before, you can't actually secure negative liberties or positive liberties or social rights in context of social inequity, social inequality or discrimination. Consequently, achieving that full human flourishing I described requires that we add a fifth aspiration to our project of governance, the delivery of social equality, non-discrimination to all. Again, that is the revolution that young people all over the world have put on the table for us as the thing that we need to do now. And they're right. And in fact, although we celebrate constitutional democracy, we've spent 250 years in the US accepting a constitutional democracy that also had woven into it a social constitution based on racial domination. So what this uh, chart suggests is that a full theory of justice, a full theory of, of good governance for the 21st century will recognize that we have to go beyond even a conception of constitutional democracy to a conception that links that up with a just social constitution. And the conception that there is caught by the concept of an egalitarian 
participatory democracy where we are achieving that egalitarian ethos and participatory possibilities across all dimensions of our society, including across the social realm. So when I lay out the project of good governance, the theory of justice in this way, it should draw our attention to several key features of democratic governance. Let me just actually return to this slide for a moment. What this slide should make clear is that different kinds of regime types have different overarching objectives to pursue. If you live in a material well-being protecting authoritarian autocratic regime, that regime needs to deliver basic material security. It may need to deliver social rights. That's pretty much all it has to deliver in order to maintain legitimacy on its own terms. However, in a constitutional democracy or better yet in an egalitarian participatory democracy, success in governance, success in meeting any crisis requires not only delivering basic material security, but also protecting negative liberties, protecting positive liberties, protecting social rights and delivering social equality, non-discrimination, equity in our social sphere. In other words, five aspirations simultaneously. The job of governance is to figure out how to align those objectives with one another. Now, as I say this, I also want you to notice that what this means is that good governance requires a huge array of kinds of expertise. For basic material security, you need economic expertise. In the context of this COVID pandemic, we needed health expertise. We needed scientific expertise. We needed all those kinds of expertise to deliver basic material security. But we also needed expertise in civil liberties. And we also needed expertise in the delivery of education and social supports to people. And we also needed expertise in equity. We needed all those kinds of expertise in one question or one conversation about how to align our efforts to deliver successful governance for the kind of society we aspire to be. So this then, as I said, um, leads to a picture of the key features of democratic governance for the 21st century, where we're elevating our ambition and lifting our aspirations. First, integrative policymaking and judgment. We can't simply rely on expecting economists to tell us what to do, or we can't simply expect the scientists to tell us what to do. No, it's our job to set our sights on that overarching goal of a society that supports flourishing across all the five dimensions that I named, and then to ask ourselves the question of how do we get the expertise across all those dimensions into the room for a conversation that permits us to make a judgment about the best path towards realizing all of those aspirations. We need to engage the broad public in that work of executing policymaking and judgment. Their positive rights are about participation. Good governance is about people understanding the direction of their society. And so that whole process of figuring out what's our problem, how do we diagnose it, what are our solutions, is a process that needs to be worked through participatory processes with the public. What this process has to deliver is a healthy social contract, in the first instance, via negative and positive liberties protection. In the second instance, via social rights, social equality, non-discrimination, and the absence of disparate impact. Why is delivering a social contract, a healthy social contract, so important? At the end of the day, a healthy social contract is what gives us the resources of solidarity that can sustain hard work together in conditions of crisis on the basis of voluntary participation. The goal of being a society of free and equal self-governing individuals is to do as much of what needs to be done together, private goods and public goods, on the basis of volunteerism. That means drawing on resources of solidarity and mutual commitment and mutual engagement in the process of delivering this kind of egalitarian participatory democracy for all of us. So a healthy social contract is a resource for effective governance. I think the case of Taiwan that you talked about earlier today is probably a perfect example of what it means to have the resources of solidarity to draw on that flow from a healthy social contract. So in short, these four features of democratic governance come together in the creation of common purpose. At the end of the day, for human beings to coordinate, move through time together to a shared objective, there has to be clarity about that place we're going, that common purpose. And that doesn't mean that everybody has to resolve all of their differences or particular interests into a single thing. But for some element of our work, coordination is key, and it's key to the well-being of all of us. And for that coordination, we need to achieve 
creation of common purpose. So that brings me to radical exchange and what I think this community has to offer. Um, I have so loved working with the folks in this community precisely because energy and imagination and creativity is brought to bear on a search for mechanisms that maximize the use of free exchange to align public and private goods and thereby deliver material security, negative and, and positive, sorry, and social rights protection and social equality. In other words, as I understand the work of the radical exchange community across the areas of research and cultural work, what we're looking for is mechanisms, ways of organizing human interaction, human exchange that maximize free exchange, maximize voluntarism, voluntary participation. And by virtue of how those exchanges and interactions and modes of participation are structured, serve to align public and private goods. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and the purpose of aligning public and private goods is that maximizes our ability to deliver that full complement of our objectives, material security, negative, positive, and social rights protection, and social equality. Excuse me again for one second. <coughs> now, as I've had the pleasure of working with Glenn and others from the radical exchange community, I've also learned something about what it takes to move from a good idea an elegant, clear view of how we can reorganize our exchanges, our interactions with each other, to implementation of that in the world. There is the challenge in some sense of taking the elegance and simplicity of, for example, a mathematical model and converting that into the material realities of human practices, human norms, institutional protocols, and the like. And so I've come to think that the power of radical exchange, its greatest power will lie in bringing into connection and collaboration those who are able to do that work on those mechanisms that deliver justice and efficiency in a aligned package with those who are also are able to think about institutional design. And here, I mean, not so much the part which is about figuring out how we want our institutions to work, the goals, more the part of actually helping to design the institutions so that they work in those ways. So it is the move from goal setting to implementation. But the point is that the work of realizing the pattern of interaction sketched via a sort of radical exchange mechanism or idea depends on a whole slew of concrete institutional and organizational policies and human social practices. It requires shifting norms. That requires work in the domain of culture. That requires work with aesthetic resources. It requires prophecy and prophetic engagement. But then the norm shifting has to be connected to people in concrete places, businesses, and schools, and mayor's offices, and governor's offices, reimagining how they do very basic things, even like organize agendas or structure meeting processes. And so there's an element of institutional design, which is as important to the work of radical exchange as the conceptual work. And the, the job is to marry these, th these things together. As Glenn said to start, the work is experimental. And this has to be as true on the institutional design side as on the development of mechanisms that give us the target uh, for what we're trying to build um, in our social organizations, in our social systems. So I'm turning here to the nitty gritty, the technical, but not because I want to take away from the importance of Juneteenth and the power of the prospect of emancipation. It's rather to try to drive home what I think is a, a hard point, a counterintuitive point, that emancipation at the end of the day, depends on this work of constitution. That's what this really is. And revolution depends on the work of reconstitution. So 
to be free and equal self-governing individuals is really about being able to see how the structures around us guide and shape our actions to identify those pressure points in them, those leverage points where they can be redesigned. And then also to identify the sequence of human conversations and human choices that can motivate big communities of people to affirm that that pressure point should be redesigned in the relevant way. Again, it's hard to bring an aspect or air of romance to that work of mechanism design and institutional design, but they are at the end of the day, the activities through which power is reorganized. So it is a moment of revolution. It is a moment for transformation. And I am 100% confident that this community of thinkers and doers and creatives have among you the vision and resources to transform our world. I am so grateful to be a part of the work and a part of this conversation and really eager to learn from all of you what you see as the path forward to the fullest emancipation in our social constitution as well as our political constitution in our economic constitution also. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. That was uh, so beautiful. And um, we've got a great set of questions. And rather than insert any of my own, I'm going to sort of twist towards my little bit of interpretation, some of the great questions we're getting from the audience. So one question we have is about um, precisely what you said at the end, the economic regimes. And um, the, the discussion that you had around material security um, almost made it as if there was sort of an, an immediacy to the nature of what, what it was that um, determines those rather than incorporating it into the theory of democracy that you were raising. And um, I wonder if you could elaborate on your thoughts about the nature of economic regimes that are consistent with these different models. And in particular, something that's very core to me, the notion that actually the economy itself and the democracy and the, the penetration of democratic structures into the structure of the economy is core to delivering material security, but also delivering on the promise of democracy. So I do think I didn't spend as much time on questions of the economy. So it's a super important question. Um, I do think that the economic and the political and the social constitutions are all completely interconnected with each other. And so when I said this is a moment for reconstitution, rebuilding our social constitution, that then necessarily means it's a moment for rebuilding our political constitution. And I sort of spell that out in that chart. But then yes, that sort of follows on and means there's gotta be a way in which we're rethinking our economic constitution as well. And so for me, yes, I think there are questions about the relationship between concepts like free labor, concepts like monopoly power, um, how that's broken up, and what we achieve in our political and social constitution. So I do see the work of radical exchange on building a free and cooperative economy um, as critical to a foundation for the egalitarian particip participatory democracy as trying to sketch. Um, great. Another very important question that I know you've been thinking a lot about recently, and it's very important how you've influenced me, uh, comes from Margaret Levy, and it's around immigrants um, and transnational issues. Um, and, you know, um, you, you talked about the social foundation of egalitarian participatory democracy. Another critical element, which is sort of the social, goes right along with that is, where do we draw if or do we draw the boundaries around the polity? Um, and I know you've been- I knew you were gonna ask me that, that question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so well, it's actually <laughs> Margaret who asked that in this case, so I, but I, I did put my own spin on it. No, fair enough. Now, I was even thinking about that this morning because I thought that's gonna be the hardest question Glenn's gonna ask me. And so I have to, have to get ready. 
Um, so, you know, I, I have to admit, this is one I continue to wrestle with. So let me lay out a few thoughts and then some questions, okay? So without any question, um, I believe it's important to understand human being um, in its relational element and in the, um, the, way, the way in which there's a connection between relationality and empowerment. In other words, um, for our relationships to be healthy, they have to be contexts in which we experience empowerment. And that is true on an intimate personal level, it's also true on a political level. And when one starts to see human flourishing in this way, one quickly recognizes that people are members of multiple communities and empowerment matters across all those different memberships. You can't tell a story about whether or not human beings have access to empowerment simply by looking at a national uh, frame for that and the question of, you know, what's the sort of structure of their political rights in a given polity. That matters, that's part of the story of empowerment, but it's not the only part of the story. And so, as you know, I've argued that we should recognize that we're all polypolitanism, polypolitans. We're not cosmopolitans, that is to say, that's a word that literally means you're a citizen of the whole globe. And in that regard, in some sense, a citizen of nowhere. Um, and instead, I wanna say, we're actually all the, the citizens of many communities. Um, and one of the jobs we have is to figure out how to negotiate the relations among those different kinds of membership. All right, so then what happens to the nationalist picture in there? So the polypolitan frame supports the transnational approach to political engagement, the transnational approach to thinking about the structure of the economy or thinking about cultural life and civic life and so forth. So it certainly decenters the nation. There's no question about that. And so then for me, the question is, well, well, what is the nation then? I mean, so what are what is it as a node? Um, are there still distinctive roles and functions that the nation plays? And here I think I continue to think that the answer is yes. And I think the answer has something to do with our need for coordination at several different scales. And there are certain kinds of things that it is very useful to be able to coordinate um, at a certain kind of geographically scaled level. And that is what the nation state does. And we continue to need nation states for that reason. There are many things in our lives that do not need to be coordinated at the level of the sort of geographical scale of a particular island or a particular portion of a continent um, or whatever else. But there do seem to be some human phenomena where that boundedness is relevant. And to some extent, actually, COVID is a good example of that, right? That is to say, um, it makes sense that the island nations are approaching the problem of COVID on, you know, on their own, that that's sort of the right unit um, of scale at which to approach that problem. Um, in the US, um, it's been really problematic that we haven't approached COVID at the level of the kind of continental shape of the country. So I think it's that issue of what are the right things that should be coordinated at the scale of the geographic unit that the nation state happens to be that we should be asking in order to figure out where the nation state fits in a whole picture of types of coordination. Let me just push you a little bit more on that because I thought that that was a really interesting point about geography and I and I agree geography is critically important to many of these things. I've often seen that actually as being a case against the nation state rather than in its favor um, in terms of some of these coordination issues. I think of the issue of rivers. Um, you know, rivers are a geographic feature that notoriously fails to respect the nation state. Um, and it's often highly arbitrary boundaries, especially uh, outside of, you know, the places that wrote the nation state into our lives, like, you know, Western Europe and the United States. So you think about like Latin America or Africa, where key geographic and historical geographic um, things cut across the boundaries of nations. Sure, no, I mean, of course, I think that's absolutely right. I think the important point is just that there's no specific scale that is in an a priori way, the right scale for everything. And so actually one of the key jobs of governance is to like think through what is the right scale for everything. And that's, you know, one of my favorite features of the Federalist Papers is that they like, they're sitting there going, well, well, we think this one should be at the level of the state. We think this one should be at the federal level. And they have reasons for thinking that the scale sort of should play out in different ways. And I think, you know, some of the choices they made then actually are no longer pertinent. So for example, the, the notion that health um, is mainly handled at the level of the state in the US, that's a mistake at this point. It's sort of the issues of economies of scale really mean that one should migrate to a higher level of scale, I think, than the sort of state level. I'd be curious to know what you think about that, right? So in other words, I think that there should be, we need a kind of capacity to adjust 
the scale level on which different problems are being addressed over time. Um, and that's the real issue um, from my point of view. Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly how I look at it. I, I think of that there's needs to be a plurality of polities and we need to have flexibility and yet also persistence. And so the nation state is one institution that needs to persist, yep. but it should be perfectly persistent. It shouldn't Correct. be utterly rigid. Religion, all of these things are things that deserve our respect, uh, despite their arbitrary nature in many ways. Uh, and yet also an imperfect respect where we remain open to the emergence of new forms so, of polity, yeah. The only thing I would disagree with you on that actually is the designation of these different entities um, and their scales as being arbitrary. So in other words, um, their boundaries may be arbitrary in meaningful ways, but I think if what we're saying about scale and flexibility and persistence are all correct, then the very need for persistence to some degree of some elements is suggests a kind of non-arbitrary reason for why that scalar level works. Yeah, right? I, I mean, the, the, to some extent, they're arbitrary. I mean, I don't think religion is arbitrary either. I mean, I think that uh, you know many many atheists or you know agnostics would say that it's arbitrary, but you know, I, I don't think that's true either. I think all, all human institutions are sort of partly ill-suited to the purposes they end up serving but yeah. are necessary compromises with the need to draw boundaries somewhere and to uh, persist in some way, even beyond uh, the precise context in which they were constant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think anyway. I agree with that. Um, so uh, from Luis uh, Aragones, we have the question, um, which is very related to this, about the extent to which in order to bring about this type of vision that we're talking about, we are going to need coordinations across existing nation states. And how, how is that possible to achieve in our increasingly nationalistic world? Right. So I think that's a super interesting um, question. And I think this is what I would love to sort of hear a debate about. In fact, you know, if you guys could organize a panel to debate this, then I think it would be very fascinating um, because you know, I think the model I gravitate to is one in which um, you have people collaborating across national boundaries so in a transnational fashion, but also working specifically on change internally to the nation, nation, nation state they happen to be a member of. So in other words, I don't imagine a kind of horizontal boundary list kind of collaboration. I imagine rather a kind of um, learning community um, of shared sort of mutual work and aspiration um, that then is able to sort of start turning wheels inside of their specific nation state because there's so much um, there's so so much sort of architecture for driving you know human societies inside nation states that you kind of have to drive through and with them you know rather than against them I guess would be my suggestion. Well, as a practical matter, that is how radical exchange has constituted itself with geographic local groups. Though we have other forms of distinction as well, so certainly mm -hmm. as a practical matter, consistent with that. Um, very interesting question from Oxo Sol. I, uh, I'm curious about this as well. Do you know about um, democratic confederalism, Rojava? Uh, th these are models that have really, um, within certain elements of the radical exchange community, I think, been quite interesting and provocative. Um, you know, similarly related are, are uh, Murray uh, Butchkin's, uh, Butchkin's ideas. Uh, I, I don't know if you've been exposed to any of those and what your thoughts are about them. Only very lightly. So, I mean, in general, I've been had an interest in confederalism. And so I guess we'd like to know more what the context is of, of the question. So in other words. Um, yeah, so Ro Rojava is the um, Kurdish, uh, uh, you know, ima imagined and sometimes practical homeland. Uh, and it was, and, and one of the founders of it, um, who's now in jail, uh, Mohammed Erjalan, was very influenced by Murray Bookchin's uh, ideas that are, you know, sort of related to various types of anarcho syndicalism and so forth. Um, but anyways, if you're not familiar with it, it's probably not the best topic for conversation. Okay. Sure. Um, uh, I think another great question, which is quite related to this, is suppose we apply these types of principles. So let me frame it in a slightly different way than Christina did, which is there was a great piece written by someone in the radical exchange community um, about what attracted him about radical exchange ideas rather than standard 
leftist discourse within the academy. And he said that he saw those disciplines, which are so focused on liberation, uh, creating their own hierarchies that were at least as oppressive as the nation states oppressive hierarchies within their own fields. Mm -hmm. And he said that that rang hollow to him. Uh, and so therefore he, he thought, you know, any, anything that should work writ large should also have some insights writ small. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that radical exchange ideas seem to ha have that scalability. And so I wanna ask his question to you, what can we learn about how the academy needs to be rethought and how collaboration across fields needs to be reimagined from mm -hmm. these principles of, uh, you know, difference without domination that we'd like to see enacted at larger scales. Right. Um, thank you. And thank you for invoking that, that principle. Um, so uh, I didn't, when I talked about integrative uh, policymaking, I didn't explicitly invoke the issue of technocracy, which I should have done. Um, and really, I was trying to lay out an, uh, an alternative to a technocratic approach to thinking um, and to policy development. And I think that that sort of same challenge would apply in the context of a university. Um, it really, so, and I think the only way in which people begin to uh, recover the ability to think in an integrative way and to do integrative work is actually just playing to do it. <laughs> um, and I think actually in order to do it, I think one of the things I've learned from working on the COVID stuff is um, I think you have to do it fast. That's gonna sound strange and sort of arbitrary, but I think it was the sort of, it was the press of necessity that I think made it possible for a lot of people in the last three months to think, to learn how to think in an integrative way that didn't actually come um, habitually to them given how they've been trained in their disciplines. And there was a sense in which the need for speed liberated people, right? Because normally in the academic context, you're developing a paper and then you're gonna send it out for a referee, you know, referee reports, and that's gonna take like months. And in the meanwhile, because you haven't actually gotten any feedback from anybody, you're not allowed to like think the next thought, right? You can't advance your own thinking because you don't even know the direction you're going is gonna be validated or not. So there's a whole lot of like paralysis built into academic intellectual processes. And so I think if I were gonna sort of change anything, the first thing I would do would just be to get that out uh, and to figure out how to give people fast deadlines, um, insist that they share stuff um, imperfectly, you know, with errors in it and expose themselves to the conversations that build on that. So I do think some of the um, kind of authoring mechanisms that Radical Exchange has been developing um, and some of the kind of collaborative writing mechanisms that Radical Exchange have been has been developing should be pulled into the academy. Yeah, one one thing that really resonated me, with me about what you said, I mean, obviously we had that experience together, but even before that, the experience of moving from the academy into the business world, the business world has many imperfections. In fact, a good chunk of this conference is about those imperfections. But one thing that has been liberating about it is that there's always a little bit of that need for speed and to mm -hmm. deliver impact mm -hmm. and that uh, the sort of excuse of, well, this is my lane just doesn't work within the business world. That's you right. Um, answers so, are needed. Answers yeah. are needed and they are needed now. And so, you're standing there, so. So, I mean, but by the way, this also brings me back to the point that you, we, we talked about before, which is that I think we need to work with many imperfect institutions knowing that they're imperfect and problematic. Mm -hmm. Um, because they often balance each other's faults. You know, the business world, there's many things to rag on and the academy often rags on it. There's many things to rag on about the academy. And I think they're both correct. And the reality is that at the intersection between these things, we discover liberatory new possibilities. Yep. Uh, and in fact, uh, absent that intersection and just trying to create something entirely new, usually just end up in chaos or, or violence or domination. So I actually exactly. think by precisely working with the imperfections of existing institutions that we discover, you know, liberation through pluralism. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Nicely, nicely said. Um, so um, another interesting question, provocative one from someone anonymous uh, here is, um, we've, we've seen a lot of um, challenges of instability within democracies and polarization and, um, and conflict. And the obvious attraction of autocracy 
is the avoiding of some of those, at least for some period of time. I, I don't want to completely grant the premise to the questioner, but um, but how do you how do you address that? Um, yeah. yeah, no, I mean you you've got it. Um, so I mean I think different kinds of regime require different bases for legitimacy. So an autocracy um, requires less, frankly, in order to maintain legitimacy over time, but it also delivers less um, to its people. So yes, um, an egalitarian participatory democracy has a harder job to do and polarization, divisiveness, paralyzation are fatal to it. Um, and so yes, um, you know there is that danger. And so that just means one has to really understand how to avoid that danger, how to prevent it in the first instance, or if it emerges, how to cure it. Um, but it's really a question of what level of benefit do you wanna to deliver to human beings? Um, if you wanna deliver the full possible range of benefits uh, to human beings, then you have no alternative but to figure out how to take on that more significant legitimacy burden that comes from trying to operate an egalitarian participatory democracy. Yeah, I think what you just said was um, really significant to me because the, the usual discourse is, well, there might be an autocracy that has higher material living standards and even higher material equality than some egalitarian system uh, or some democratic system. So it might even have higher material equality. Um, I think that the, the real question is that you're asking us to think about equality in terms that themselves immediately rule out autocracy as delivering equality. But the thing that's yes. interesting about that's that, right. that a lot of yes. the left does not frame equality in those terms right. and therefore opens itself up directly to an autocratic uh, question, you know? Yeah. It, it yeah. says that, that equality is about some notion of purchasing power, but you cannot purchase the right to participate in your democracy. Exactly. So that's, if you look at American intellectual traditions, I think one of the most interesting features of our traditions are actually, I mean, it's, it's kind of straightforward, but sort of 19th century split between um, sort of white um, thinkers about freedom and black thinkers about freedom. So that if you look at sort of the tradition, um, the sort of American versions that grew out of Mill and so forth um, took things in the direction of what became recognizable sort of 20th century liberalism, um, where the focus really did shift to negative liberties, not positive liberties, and to um, ultimately sort of material um, equality. Whereas actually in African-American thinkers, and Melvin Rogers has written about this in a brilliant way, um, you know, small r republicanism remained the number one commitment. Um, the recognition that um, actually there was no permanent security, even for material well-being without political security. Um, that you might think you have material security, but it's temporary if you don't actually have control rights. Um, and so control rights are fundamental, political equality is fundamental. And so, and then that manifests itself in the middle of the 20th century in the black power movement in various ways. And actually, honestly, like across, you know, sort of the world of philosophy, I think we're seeing a flowering of, of that political philosophy again, of that sort of focus on power sharing, um, political equality, and the recognition that those things are actually themselves necessary to securing material equality over the long term. I and mean, it's sort of back to the issue of persistence uh, that you raised. Yeah. Um, okay, let me take one more question before we have to wrap up. Um, I think this is another provocative one. What do you see the role of reparations being in realizing more egalitarian democracy? Or do you think that that is a misconception, a wrong way of framing uh, the issue? I, I have my own views on this, but I'm very curious about I'll be very blunt. I mean, I'm an outlier on this one. I don't actually think it's the right way of, of framing things for the most part. There are exceptions. I mean, the Tulsa race riots, there's still folks who are descendants of people who lost property. And I think in all of those cases where you can concretely tie direct relationships, we should absolutely be carrying out reparations. Or for example, in Chicago with the massive cases of police torture, Chicago has now undertaken reparations for those cases to those specific people um, who were incredibly badly damaged by the abuse of police power. So in other words, I think reparations is a useful concept for the specific cases where there are 
um, real links between wrongdoers and specific victims. I think as a generalized concept, it's not helpful. And on, with regard to the generalized problems of inequity and injustice, I am much more interested in a really thorough reconstitution of our civil society organizations, commercial and nonprofit, a really thorough reconstitution of our political institutions and so forth. So I'm more interested in reconstitution in that generalized context than in reparations. I think I share that with you. I think my, my perspective on it is that reparations itself is sort of parasitic upon a very individualistic private property based conception of the economic sphere, which is itself problematic. Yeah, and I would agree. So I would much rather see that reimagined to a point where reparations no longer becomes a very meaningful concept rather than reparations within our current environment, which I fear would quickly degenerate into other forms of inequality in the same way that the privatizations in Russia of state assets, which were meant to achieve some notion of equality, quickly unraveled into oligarchy. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. So. Anyway, okay, well, no, thank you. Never actually asked me that question in public before. So you just got my first on the record public statement on my career. I tried to choose from the questions the most provocative ones, but I'm glad one actually pushed you. So you got one. Um, it's wonderful to uh, uh, have this exchange with you and thank you so much for all you've added to our community. Um, thank you. Take thank care. You, ben. Take good care. Bye.